Good. All right. Good morning, ladies. So uh, I was going through the syllabus yesterday um, and realized that we have another exam this coming Monday. Uh, so our announcements today are that our next exam will be Monday. Uh, hopefully I'll have the first exam graded by then. Um, I just haven't really found time that I can actually grade yet. Uh, so I haven't told you, but my wife is also teaching. <coughs> So on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays, as soon as I'm done teaching, then she teaches until three. So I get to play, you know, guardian angel with my children and all that good stuff. So, uh, so basically, it's been kind of hard to find time to grade. But uh, I'll try to get that done definitely by Monday, you know, the weekend and everything. Uh, so yeah, so our next exam is actually already this Monday. That's going to cover chapters 16 and 17. So 16 will definitely finish today, give you some group assignments to work on. Hopefully, we'll start 17. Uh, for the last part of class today. If not, at least we'll, we'll do those on tomorrow and Friday, so we'll get all that done. Um, good, so exam two examples, um, old exam examples have been posted. Uh, those are on Blackboard. The extra credit's also on Blackboard. Uh, and all of the homework questions and everything are up on Pearson, so on Mastering in Physics, and I'll post them uh, Let's see what else is on here. So, and don't forget, we have conceptual questions today. I'll post those later. So, conceptual questions. So, those will be due tomorrow. So, good. So, those are our beautiful announcements. Um, and yeah. So, good. So, today, Next thing we're gonna talk about is, so, so far we have defined that the electric field is the force per unit charge, which again, we said has units of newtons per coulomb. But what this is basically telling us is what? If we measure the force, then we can determine the electric field. But the opposite of this is also true in the fact that if we know the electric field, we can also calculate the force, okay? So what this means is if we know what the electric field is throughout an entire region of space, and then we take a charge and we put it at a particular location in that space, then we can also measure the force on that as well. So this one presumes that what? We know the force and we're gonna find the electric field from there. So this one is we know force and we want the electric field. And this one is saying, well, the opposite. We know the electric field and what we want is the force. So as long as we know that we have an electric field, then we can also determine the force, which is gonna be on some sort of charged particle. So that's what we're gonna spend a little bit of time on today. So let's do a couple examples of that. So let's say, for example, uh, I have those parallel plate capacitors. So let's say here's my parallel plates. So let's say this is our positive charge plate. Some distance below that is gonna be my negative charge plate. So this is then negative charge. Say these are separated by some distance of D. So that this has a charge of Q, this has a charge of minus Q. And what we're gonna do is take a charged particle here. So this has a charge of Q, little q with a mass of M, initially moving parallel to the plates with an initial velocity of V zero. Okay. <clears throat> And let's assume that Q is positive just so we can kind of see what happens. So basically what's gonna happen then is I'm gonna shoot this charged particle between these charged plates. And what'll happen is, let's take a look. So by the time the charged particle gets on the inside of the plate, so let's say here's my charged particle, it's then going to feel a force. And it's gonna feel a force because we know that's what? An electric field has to point from a positive charge to a negative charge, which means that between the plates, this electric field points then straight downward. And we kind of talked about this yesterday. We know the electric field is equal to the charge density divided by epsilon naught inside the plates, or that's the same thing as the total charge divided by the total area divided by epsilon naught. So this is the electric field inside the plates. <clears throat> So because there's an electric field and this thing has a charge, what we now know then is that what? Since it's a positive charge, this thing has to experience a force in the same direction as the electric field, which means this thing is gonna feel a force downward. Okay. So basically what'll happen is what? As this charged particle moves inside of the plate, it's going to feel a force perpendicular to the direction of its motion, 
which means it's going to curve its path. So if I was looking at the path of the charged particle as it moves inside the plates, the force then is perpendicular to its direction, so this thing is going to undergo a curved path until it comes out of the plates, and once it comes out of the plates, then it will move in a straight line again. Because once it's outside of the plates, there's no force acting on it again, so it's gonna move completely in a straight line at this stage. So what we wanna know then, for example, is, what is delta y? How much is our charged particles path deflected in the, say, y direction? So let's choose that positive y is downward, just to make this a little bit easier, due to the fact of this thing moving through a charged plate. Uh, I have another picture of it here so you can see a little bit better. But here we have a charge, uh, a charged particle of mass M in charge Q, again, enters the region between two plates, each of the same magnitude of charge, however, oppositely, uh, opposite signs, uh, initially moving parallel to the plates, by how much is it deflected? So again, I wanna know what is the delta Y? So again, as this thing moves in, it feels a force, tangential or perpendicular to its velocity, initially, causing this thing to move in a curved path, and I wanna know by how much is this thing actually deflected? to another page. So this is our plan. So again, let's say here's my charged particle. I know it's feeling a force downward. So this is the direction of my force. Here is the top plate, or the bottom plate, excuse me, let's call that negative sign. Here is my top plate, positive sign. And let's say the length of the plates is equal to L. So each plate is the length of L to it. And again, this thing is going to undergo a curved path and then come out straight. And again, from here, what I want to know is what is delta y? Okay. So, <clears throat> so first things first. So let's look at the force. So the sum of the forces, according to Newton's second law, <clears throat> acting on our charged particle is simply equal to the mass times the acceleration. But in this case, we know the only force which is acting on this is the electric force, which is gonna be the charge of the particle times the electric field and is equal to the mass times the acceleration. Because the only force acting on this thing is the electric force in this direction. So from here, we can find the acceleration. So this says the acceleration then is gonna be the charge times the electric field divided by the mass of the particle. Is okay? Not bad so far, right? So good. So now if I want to know the deflection, we're going to use kinematics. So let's go back to our kinematic equations. Kinematics. So <clears throat> kinematics says then that the deflection delta y then is equal to the initial velocity in the y direction times time plus one half the acceleration times the time squared. But remember initially, the velocity of this thing is initially pointing in the horizontal direction. So this is asking for the initial velocity in the y direction, but what's the initial velocity in the y direction? Zero, good job. So this guy is zero, so that means the deflection then is simply equal to one half the acceleration times the time squared. Now we can do this because remember that, again, in between the plates, the electric field is simply equal to a constant. So here the acceleration is also equal to a constant, which allows us to be able to use the kinematics here. So good. So now let's use this acceleration. So this says then that the deflection is gonna be one half the charge of the charged particle times the electric field divided by the mass of the charged particle times the time squared. So this is our deflection. Delta Y. So this says I can know the amount of deflection if I know the amount of time it stays within the plates. Right? So this time here is the amount of time spent between the plates. So how can I determine the amount of time it spends between the plates? So how could I do that? So what do I know? I know the length of the plates, 
I know the speed at which this thing is moving. But let me ask you a question. We know the acceleration due to the electric force is in the y direction, but is there any acceleration in the x direction? Meaning, is this thing going to speed up or slow down in the horizontal direction? What do you think? I would guess that it would slow down at least a little bit because of the new force acting on it. True. Well, let's think about how the force is acting. So the force is acting, again, it's moving this way, but the force is acting this way. So, so would that change the velocity in this direction? No. No. Right. This is the same thing with parabolic motion, where if I take this guy and I throw it across the room, Right, the force in this case is only the gravitational force pulling it downward, which means the acceleration is downward. But remember, there's no force in the horizontal direction. So basically, this is causing parabolic motion, but there's no change in the velocity in the horizontal direction. So this means that in the horizontal direction, since there's no acceleration in the horizontal direction, this velocity, the initial, will stay the initial for the x portion of the velocity. So at any location this thing is along the horizontal direction, the x component of the velocity is still that initial horizontal, initial velocity. Even though its velocity is overall increasing, because now it's gaining velocity in the y direction, so its velocity at any point will be greater, but the horizontal portion never changes. So since the horizontal portion never changes, we can use that to then use the length to then determine the time. So remember but that. Mm -hmm. If that force um, had a x component, then it would change the velocity in the x. Correct. Exactly. So only if the force had an x component. In that case, then there would be an acceleration in the x direction, which would either speed it up or slow it down. That's right. But here, since the force is always in the same direction as the electric field, that's what this thing is telling us. These two have to be in the same direction because this is a positive charge. <clears throat> then that means the, in this case, the force will always be in the vertical direction, nothing in the horizontal direction. That's right. So good. So what this says then is that remember the change in, well, let's see, velocity is equal to the change in position over the change in time. In this case, we know our velocity is the initial velocity. Our change of position is L, just the length of the plates, and our change in time we're just going to call t. <clears throat> so what this tells us then is the amount of time in the charged particle stays between the plates is then simply equal to the length of the plates divided by the velocity. <clears throat> so let's use that over here. So finally this says that the deflection is going to be the charge times the electric field divided by the mass times then the length of the plate squared divided by the initial velocity squared. So this is our deflection. So, again, if this thing is moving initially parallel to the plates, to find the amount of deflection, we just need to know the length of the plates, how fast is it initially going, its charge and its mass, and the magnitude of the electric field on the inside. So this is then the deflection. Okay. Not too bad. Let's do another one. So the next one's going to be a little more complicated, because we like more complicated. The next one says that in the figure below, we have a uniform uh, upward electric field, which has a magnitude of 2 times 10 to the third newtons per coulomb, has been set up between uh, the horizontal plates by charging the lower plate positively and the uh, bottom plate negatively, which means the electric field points upward. So then it says that the length of the plates here is 10 centimeters. They're separated by a distance of two centimeters. And it wants to know if we have an electron that is shot between the plates uh, from the left edge, that it makes an angle here of 45 degrees relative to the lower plate. And it has a magnitude of six times 10 to the sixth meters per second. So that's how fast it's moving. Will the electron strike one of the plates? So basically the question is, if I have the electron coming in here, since it's a negative charge, what that means then is the force has to be opposite to the direction of the electric field. Because again, going back to here, if this is a negative charge, what that means then is if the electric field points up, 
I have to take that negative into account, which means the force is going to be downward. Okay? So in this case, if it's a negative charge, the force is in the opposite direction. So as this thing moves in here, the force then is going to be downward, which is going to cause this electron to then start to curve in this direction. So what I want to know is, is the electric field weak enough that this thing is going to curve, but not enough to miss the top plate and hit the top plate? Or is the electric field too strong that this thing is going to curve drastically and then hit the bottom plate? Or is the electric field just right that this thing is going to come in, maybe skim the top plates, miss it, and then come out through the plates unscathed? So it's going to go completely in an arc. And then part B then says, well, if it does hit a plate, which plate is it going to hit? So is it going to hit the top plate or is it going to hit the bottom plate? And then how far from the left edge is it going to hit? So for example, if it hits the top plate, what's this distance here? So if it hits here, what's the distance? Or if it goes like this, then what's the distance across here? So first we want to know, does it hit a plate? And then finally, we want to know if it does hit a plate, where does it hit the plate? And so this is our question. So good. So again, let's kind of redraw what's going on here. So here's our top plate. Right. Here is our bottom plate. So again, we're going to start off with an electron. So my electron is right here, right at the bottom of the plate. Velocity initially is off in this direction. So be initial. We know this is theta, where theta is 45 degrees. In this case, we know that, again, the electric field is pointing upward. So here's our electric field. But since this is an electron, so in this case, we know Q is equal to negative E, right, which is negative fundamental charge. We know the mass is equal to the mass of the electron. So again, the question is, is this thing going to curve but hit up here? Or is it going to curve and then hit down here? Right, so this is what we want to know. Is it going to hit up here or is it going to hit down here? And again, what we also know is that the distance between the plates here, which is called D, is equal to two centimeters. Okay. So <clears throat> let me ask you some questions. So question number one, how would I know that it hits the top plate? So Mathematically speaking, how could I know if it will hit the top plate or not? So again, we know the electron is here, moving in this direction initially, but it's feeling a force downward this way, right? So ultimately, what is the electron going to do? Well, it's going to go under a parabolic path. Right. It's going to do something like this inside of the plates. Right. So <clears throat> if I know this distance here is two centimeters, and let's say I want to know this distance here, which is the distance to max height. So let's call that y max. So what would be true? So if max height then is greater than the distance of separation between the two plates, what does that mean? It would hit the plate. It would hit the plates, right? So basically, what that implies to us then is that the first thing we want to do is actually calculate what is the max height, right? Because if we ma calculate the max height where this thing is going to reach to before it's going to momentarily stop and then turn around, in this case, if the max height is greater than D, then that means it hits the top plate, right? But if Y max, is less than D, then that means it's going to miss the top plate. Okay. Everyone okay with this? So the first thing we want to do then is let's calculate Y max. Okay. So what is Y max? This is what we want to know. <clears throat> Good. So how would I calculate Y max? Now, what has to be true at this point here at Y max? What is what tells me where I reach the maximum height? What has to be true at the maximum height? So think about your 175 class. What's that, Katie? The velocity would 
go to zero in the y direction. Good. So when it reaches max height, what well, we know is that the y portion of the velocity must be zero at this point. Good. So let's write down the y portion of velocity. So here we're going to use a kinematic equation number one. So kinematic equation number one says that the velocity in the y direction then is going to be equal to the initial velocity in the y direction. So that's going to be v initial times sine of 45 degrees minus the acceleration, which in this case is a, times then the time. Now here the acceleration is going to be, well, according to our free body diagram, the sum of the forces in the y direction are again are equal to ma. Only force acting on it again is the electric force. So we have the electric force then is equal to ma. The electric force in this case is going to be what? The fundamental charge times the electric field is equal to ma, which means a then is going to be equal to the fundamental charge times the electric field divided by the mass. Right? So we know a. Good, so as Katie said, what has to be true is by the time it reaches max height, the y portion of the velocity must be equal to zero. So we can write this then as v initial sine of 45 degrees minus a times t, solve for t. So this says t then is gonna be equal to v initial sine of 45 degrees, all divided by the acceleration. Well, that's the same thing as v initial times the mass times sine of 45 divided by e times e is equal to the time. Everyone's okay? So this is the amount of time that it takes to get to max height. If you want, you can call that T max if you want. <laughs> Good. So Y max then is gonna be equal to, using our second kinematic equation, the initial velocity in the Y direction. So that's V naught sine of 45 degrees times time it takes to get the max height, minus one half the acceleration times the time it gets the max height squared. Okay. Good. So let's plug all that in. So this becomes equal to then. So I'm going to use this over here. So this is going to be the mass times v initial squared times sine squared of 45 degrees, all divided by e times e minus one half the acceleration, which is e e over m times t max, which is then going to be what? m squared times v initial squared times sine squared of 45 degrees, all divided by e squared, e squared. What is the, what is that underneath the first term? This one? Yeah. That's a beautiful E <laughs> okay. and another e. beautiful E. <laughs> yeah, so it's fundamental charge times the electric field. That's right. So go ahead. So let's look at the second term. So this mass here is going to cancel this mass. So we're going to have one term of mass here. This E is going to cancel this E. So I have one term of E down here. This electric field will cancel this electric field. So if I make those cancellations, notice that this term here is exactly the same as this term here except this one has a minus a half in front of it. So this is basically the same thing as x minus half of x. But x minus half of x is simply half of x. So basically, if I put this in, this is then going to be equal to then, what? So let's plug in our numbers. So this becomes 1 half m times v0 squared times sine squared of 45 degrees, all divided by e times e. Plug in my numbers. What I get in this case then is that that distance becomes 2.72 centimeters. So the maximum height that this electron is going to make it is 2.72 centimeters. Now, again, what we said was that if what max height was greater than the separation distance between the two, it's going to hit. And if the max height is less than the separation distance, it's going to miss. So is the max height greater than the separation distance? Yes. So 2.72 centimeters is greater than what, two centimeters. So in this case, we know it hits the top plate.
So good. So the answer to part A is it hits the top plate. Is okay. Now part B wants to know, okay, where does it hit? Okay. So let's kind of redraw our picture. So again, we know is here's our top plate. Here is our electron moving in this direction. V initial, 45 degrees. So we know this thing is gonna go parabolic motion, but then hit. Now what we wanna know is what is this distance here? What is X? Where does this thing hit the top plate? So good, so how would I do this problem? So how would I do this part of the problem? So how would I do that? Let me ask some probing questions. So, do we know how high it went in the vertical direction? Yeah, we know it went two centimeters. So, if we know how high it goes in the vertical direction, we can use that to solve for what? So, we know the initial velocity, we know the charge, we know the acceleration, we know all that stuff. So, what's the only thing we don't know then? X. Well, we don't know X, but how are we going to get X? So what are we going to use in the vertical direction to solve for it, to then use to get X? My first instinct is to try some kind of like coordinates that we learned with the kinematic equations prior, because we already know like the Y stuff. We just solved all of that. So now but knowing like, that it's going to hit it too. Use that to find the time and then use the time to find X. Good, you just answered my question. Exactly. So we're gonna use that two to find the time and then the time into the X to find the distance it went. Exactly. Said exactly what I wanted you to say. Good. Beautiful. So good job, Katie. So good. We're gonna do exactly that. So we're gonna look at the Y direction, right? And then use our kinematics in the Y direction to find the time. Right, so we're gonna use Y to then get time. And then as Katie said, that amount of time it takes for that thing to go two centimeters is the same amount of time it took for this thing to go the distance X. So we're gonna use that time then to find X. Exactly, exactly. Good, so in this case, we know, let's look at our Y kinematic equation. So look at the Y direction. So here we know that what y is equal to, again, the initial velocity, so v initial sine of 45 degrees times the time, minus one half the acceleration times time squared. But in this case, we know it hits at y is equal to d. So we're simply gonna set this equal to d. Now let's rearrange, let's make this look like a quadratic. So we have one half a times t squared, uh, minus the initial velocity times sine of 45 degrees times the time, is plus d is then equal to zero. So at this stage, we would have to use the quadratic to solve for t. Okay. Now in the x direction, now what we know is that what? x is equal to the initial velocity in the x direction. So it's gonna be v initial times cosine of 45 degrees times time, plus one half the acceleration times the time squared. But again, is there any acceleration in the x direction? Good job, Jelly. So in this case, we simply have this. So once we use the quadratic of the sine on the time, we use that time now into this expression here, which is now going to give us the distance at which it travels in the x direction. So here, if we do that, so we solve our quadratic, get the time, plug that time in, what we find is that this thing reaches, oh, I wrote down the wrong number before, okay. We'll fix that, that's fine. So this reaches 2.72 centimeters. Sorry, uh, I need to go back a page. So here actually this distance was wrong. Uh, this was actually, sorry about that, 2.56. I wrote down the wrong one, sorry about that. Sorry ladies. Let's fix that now. So if you go back and redo this, 
Let me actually have the right number. Okay. So this was 2.56. Doesn't change our results, but that's fine. And then, right, this one ends up being 2.72. It's okay. So good. So these are some examples of, again, if we know the force, or sorry, if we know the electric field, then we can determine the force on that charged particle. Okay. So now that we've been talking about electric fields, we can use electric fields to go back and talk about conductors. So let's talk a little bit about conductors before we move on to the last section. <laughs> so conductors, what do electric fields tell us about conductors? Well, electric fields tell us about conductors that the electric field inside a conductor must be zero. So this is what we learn about conductors and electric fields. So why is this true? Well, this is true because remember that an electric field puts a force onto a charged particle. And remember that a conductor has free charged particles which are allowed to move, which basically means that what, if this was my conductor, so let's say here's my conductor, if I had an electric field then inside the conductor, what that would do is it would take all the charges which are on the inside and apply a force to them in the direction at which that electric field pointed. So for example, if my electric field say pointed to the right, so if this was my electric field, then what that's gonna do is it's gonna put a force on all the positive charges, causing all the positive charges to feel a force to the right, Meaning overall, this thing is going to have a force pointing to the right, right? So my conductor would feel a force to the right. Since this thing feels a force to the right, what would happen? Well, this conductor then would have to accelerate to the right. Which would be pretty cool, right? So if you took your aluminum soda can and you put it on a desk, if this thing then had an electric field inside of it, it would have to start accelerating across the desk in the direction of the overall electric field. which would be cool, but that doesn't happen, right? Your soda can just simply sits there. So it has to be true then is that the electric field then inside the conductor must be equal to zero, otherwise it's gonna feel a force. Since it does not feel a force, okay? Let's say we have our conductor, but now we're gonna put charge on the conductor. So let's put charge on it. Well, what happens to all that charge? Well, what happens to all that charge is then, due to the Coulomb force, what happens then is that what? If I put a charge on the conductor, so let's say here, here's my conductor. Let's say I put charges throughout here, so let's make it positively charged. What's gonna happen then is each one of these charges are going to feel a force due to the Coulomb force causing repulsive forces on all of these guys. But since the charges are free to move inside of the conductor, what's gonna happen then is each one of these forces are gonna move away from each other as far as possible. So basically what's gonna happen is each one of these guys will feel a force towards the surface of the conductor, meaning that once I put all the charge inside of the conductor, all of these forces will then move to the exterior of the conductor. So basically what will happen then is that all the charge that this thing has will be found on the surface of the conductor. There will be no charge left on the inside. Okay. So if I put charge on it, then all the charge will move to the surface leaving none in the center. So if I had, for example, a sphere, a metal sphere, and I put charge on it, all of that charge has to be found on the surface. There'll be no charge on the center. So that the total electric field, again, will be equal to zero on the inside. Okay. Now, third thing is, what happens if I have a open cavity, say, inside of the conductor. So let's put a cavity inside the conductor. Cavity with charge. 
what happens in that case. So let's say here's my conductor. And then I'm going to cut out a cavity on the inside, much like my tooth, and then put a positive charge, say, inside of here. Okay. What happens in this case? So that's a positive charge. What happens in this case then is what? Again, due to our Coulomb attraction and repulsion, what's going to happen then is if this is a positive charge on the inside, all the negative charges then will move towards the positive charge, but then they'll be bound on the inside of this cavity. So if I look at the cavity here, the cavity then is going to have negative charges around the cavity, but since all the negative charges moved to the inside of the cavity, what that does is it leaves only positive charges then on the exterior of the conductor. So all along the surface then will be positive charges. Let's talk a little bit more about what that means. So basically what will happen then is what? If this thing has a charge to it, this has electric field lines which point radially out in all directions. Let me extend some through the conductor itself. So these are electric field lines from the charge on the inside. But due to the charge separation inside of the conductor, what happens then again is remember the electric field points from the positive charge to the negative charge. So inside of the conductor, the conductor will set up its own electric field in the opposite direction as this electric field created by the charge, which means that if this electric field points this way and this electric field points in the opposite direction, the total electric field then on the inside of the conductor will again be equal to zero. So what happens then is if we have the cavity with charge, what ends up happening is that the conductor itself shields the charge on the inside of the conductor, making it so the total electric field inside the conductor is equal to zero. So inside of the cavity, you'll find an electric field based off the amount of charge. Inside the conductor, you will see no charge. You'll see no electric field. But then when you go outside of it, you'll see all the charge on the outside where the amount of charge on the outside is equal to the amount of charge which is on the inside. So you see the initial electric field of the charge which is on the inside. So the point of all this is that as long as I have a conductor and electrostatics, now this is only true in electrostatics, the electric field on the inside must be equal to zero. Always. Again, the reason for that is so it doesn't feel a force, but if we put a charge on it, all that charge has to be on the outside, so the total electric field on the inside is equal to zero. And if we put a cavity on the inside, again, we get charge separation. On the inside wall, we'll have the charge, which is opposite the amount of charge on the inside. The exterior portion of the wall will then have the charge, which is the same charge, which is on the inside, so that the electric field on the outside looks like the charge, which is on the inside of the cavity but the total electric field on the inside has to be equal to zero. So this is what electric fields tell us about conductors. So the total electric field on the inside, again, as long as this is electrostatics, must be equal to zero. Okay. So last thing we want to talk about in this chapter is what are called electric dipoles. So let's talk about a dipole. Electric dipoles. So what's a dipole? So a dipole is two charges of equal magnitude of charge, but opposite in sign. So let's say this is minus Q and this is positive Q, separated by a distance of D. So let's say this is our distance D. What this does is this creates an electric field in between. So my electric field is going to point from the positive charge to the negative charge. So this is my electric field. But it also sets up what's called a dipole moment. So the dipole moment points then from the negative charge to the positive charge, so the opposite direction of the electric field, which we call the dipole moment little p is then equal to the charge times the distance, where that distance we're going to write it as a vector. So again, distance d here is the magnitude of d is equal to the length 
or distance between the charges. And it points from the negative charge to the positive charge. Okay. <clears throat> so that the dipole moment points in exactly the same direction as D, but it's modified in length by the charge. And notice this Q here is only the positive charge. So again, even though this thing has a negative Q here and a positive Q here, but this Q we're using here is only the magnitude of the positive charge. So it's only one of them. So this is what we call the electric dipole or the electric dipole moments. So it has to do with, again, charge separation. It's a vector which points from the negative charge to the positive charge under some sort of charge separation. So this is what we call electric dipole. Now what we want to do is take this electric dipole and put it into an external electric field. So let's take this and put this into an external electric field. And we want to see what happens to it. So what happens to it? <laughs> so for funsies, let's say our external electric field points to the right. So here is our elect external electric field pointing this way. So this is E, our external field. And then let's put our dipole. So it's oriented at some angle relative. So I'm going to draw it this way. So again, this is minus Q, this is positive Q. So that my dipole points in this direction. So this is P. And then let's define this angle here. Let me use green. There we go. As the angle theta. So that's the angle relative to the dipole relative to the electric field. Now, let's think about what's going to happen. <clears throat> so let's say here is my, my head here, here's my dipole, right? So here, I have the electric field pointing in this direction. So that means this charge up here is going to feel force in this direction. This charge down here, since it's negative, it's going to feel a force in the opposite direction as the electric field, which means it's going to feel a force in this direction. So this dipole then is going to be pulled in this direction and pulled in this direction. Mm -hmm. So basically what's going to happen is what? The top one is going to feel a force in this direction. Call that F positive. This one's going to feel a force in this direction, which we're going to call F negative. Mm -hmm. So the total force, the net force then, let's get to some of the forces, is then going to be equal to what? F plus minus F minus, right? Where I'm taking that uh, this is my positive X direction. So F plus is going to pull it in a positive direction. F minus is going to pull it in a negative direction. Mm -hmm. But we now know that force is the same thing as charge times the electric field. So this is going to be Q times E minus Q times E. But what's Q times E minus Q times E? Zero. Mm -hmm. So basically what's going to happen is what? The positive charge is going to be pulled in this direction. The negative charge is going to be pulled in this direction, but they're going to be pulled in equal and opposite directions, which means the net force that this thing is going to experience is going to be equal to zero. Okay. So the net force on this guy is simply equal to zero, <clears throat> which basically just means it won't accelerate. Daddy, my mom said, my mom said I need to take a shower, but I'm in the middle of my class, so you gotta wait for mommy. Well, 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 my mom said I have to take a shower all by myself, but, uh, but I'm not sure I can do it all by myself. You can do it. I have faith in you. Go, go give it a try. But uh, I'm afraid that 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 I'll waste all the water. <laughs> you and, will waste all. I'll and, come in and check. And and uh, also. <laughs> Make the water too hot for me. Well, that's true. Ask mommy to turn on the water for you. Okay. Issues. Okay. So, <laughs> sorry for that. So, saying that, it, here's my dipole, right? So, again, this is being pulled in this direction. This is being pulled in this direction. Well, what that's going to do is it's going to cause it to do this, 
so that the total force is equal to zero because it's not going to accelerate in this direction or in this direction. Well, that's all this thing is saying. So what this means is, what, if I put it into a constant external electric field, this thing will not feel a force, but it is going to rotate. Because right? again, if I'm pulling this one in this direction, this one in this direction, it's going to do that. Right? So what is rotational force? What do we call that? We remember what rotational force is called? Is it torque? Torque, good. So this thing is going to experience a torque. So it doesn't feel a force, it's not gonna accelerate this way or this way, but it is going to rotate and it's going to feel a torque. So let's look at the torque. So here, we know it doesn't feel a force, but it is gonna feel a torque. So let's look at the net torque. So the net torque in this case then is going to be the torque on the positive plus then the torque on the negative. Now, remember that torque is equal to what? R, where R is the distance from the pivot point to the location of the force times the force times sine of the angle between the two, right? So in this case, it's gonna pivot about the center point here. So that means this distance then is going to be R, where R then is gonna be half the distance of D, which is the separation between the two. So here, R points in this direction, F points this way, which means if I extend R here, this is then going to be the angle theta. So the angle theta is the same angle that the dipole is relative to the external electric field. Mm -hmm. So this is then going to be equal to what, D over two times then the electric field times sine of the angle plus, well, this one also has the same distance of D over two times the electric field times sine of the angle. And the two torques are actually in the same direction because this one wants to rotate it this way. This one wants to rotate it this way. So the direction of rotation here is this way. Direction here is also this way. So the two torques are in the same direction. So that's why we're gonna sum them together. So it's gonna be the same thing then as what? Uh, oh, times force, so put a Q in there. Got my Q, there you go. So it's gonna be the same thing then in D times Q times E times sine of the angle between the two. But remember Q times D is the same thing as the magnet or the electric dipole moment. So it's gonna be P times E times sine of the angle between the two. So this is then the net torque that the dipole experiences. Okay, <clears throat> this thing is here. This thing is going to then rotate into the direction of the electric field such that the torque then is equal to the magnitude of the dipole moment times the magnitude of the electric field times sine of the angle between the two. So this is then the torque on the dipole. It's okay. Now this has an energy associated with it as well. So let's talk about that energy. So this has a potential energy. So the potential energy of the dipole in the external electric field is actually given by minus the dipole moment times the electric field times cosine of the angle between the two, which means the work it takes to rotate this thing then is equal to minus the change in potential energy which is then gonna be equal to the dipole moment times the electric field times then the initial angle minus the final angle, time minus cosine of the final angle. So this is then the work done by the electric field to rotate this thing from initially this angle to now this angle. So this is the work done to rotate to my dipole. Everybody's okay? Now, remember when it comes to energy, things always start off at a high energy and wanna to go to a low energy. So same thing as if, what? Something I can throw and it doesn't break. If I started off of this and I let it go, this thing is going to fall because it's falling from a high energy to a low energy. So the dipole always wants to seek the lowest amount of energy. 
Now for the dipole itself, what that means is when it's in this configuration, it's at a higher energy than when it rotates to align itself with the electric field because that is the point of the lowest amount of energy. Right? I know that because in this case, the cosine of the angle would be zero, so the potential energy would then just be negative the dipole times the electric field. So the place of the least amount of energy is when the dipole is aligned with the electric field. The point where the dipole has the greatest amount of energy is actually when the dipole is aligned opposite to the direction of the electric field. So in this case, my electric field pointing this way, and let's say this tip up here is the arrow of the dipole, this has the greatest amount of energy. Because in this case, it's rotated 180 degrees away from it, so I have cosine of 180, which is negative one, so this is the greatest amount of potential energy, just the dipole times the electric field. Uh, applications of this are things like MRIs. So what an MRI does, is it's a little bit different, but same idea. So instead of being an electric field, it's a magnetic field. But basically what you do is you turn on a magnetic field. And what that does is it causes the magnetic dipoles to align themselves with the magnetic field. And when they align, they have work done onto them. And what the machine does is it measures the amount of work, meaning it measures the change in energy. And then from there, it can actually map out what your system is looking like. So it gives you basically an image based off of the energy as this thing is actually rotating. So that'd be an example of all this stuff. So good. So let's use that and let's do an example. So our example says, um, where is it? Did I not open it? I didn't open it. Okay, give me one second. Um, let's do this. Oops, wrong one. Examples. Okay. So good. Which chapter are we in? 16, right? Okay, so this one says, in figure, we have an electric dipole swings from an initial orientation of 20 degrees. So that is this. So it's 20 degrees below uh, this horizontal here uh, to a final uh, orientation of 20 degrees above the horizontal. So that says the electric dipole moment is uh, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 27 coulombs times meters. Then it says it's in an external magnetic or electric field, which is pointing vertically, which has a magnitude of three times 10 to the fifth newtons per coulomb. And it wants to know what is the change in the dipole's potential energy. So it wants to know how much work was done to rotate it from this position to this position. So let's kind of redraw what's happening here. So again, we have our external electric field. That external electric field is pointing vertically. So this is my electric field. Initially, my dipole moment is pointing down in this direction where it tells me that this angle here is theta initial, which is equal to 20. Afterward, it's going to rotate up. So now it points in this direction. So this is our new P. This is our initial P. So that this angle here is theta final, which is then equal to also 20 degrees. So, what I want to know then is, again, what is the work which is being done? So how much work did the electric field do to rotate this thing from this position to this position? Okay. Well, again, we know the work is equal to minus the change of potential energy, which is then equal to the dipole moment times the electric field times cosine of the initial angle minus cosine of the final angle. Okay. Now I'm writing this as a phi as opposed to theta because we have to be a little bit careful of how we're defining the angles here. Okay. So let's talk about each one of those angles. What haven't I used yet? Black. Good. So remember that the angle here is the angle relative between the dipole moment and the electric field, which means that this angle here is actually the initial angle, right? So this is actually phi initial. And then this angle here is actually phi final. So this is the angle between the electric field and the dipole. So my initial angle then, phi initial, is then going to be equal to, well, this is 90 degrees plus the initial angle that this thing is telling me. So this is 90 degrees plus theta initial, which is then equal to 110 
degrees. The final angle then, let's call that phi final, is then gonna be this angle here, which is the same thing as 90 degrees minus this final angle, which it tells me. So this is gonna be 90 degrees minus theta final, which is then equal to 70 degrees. So good, so this is then gonna be equal to numbers, uh, where is it? 1.6 times 10 to the minus 27. So this is then equal to 1.6 times 10 to the minus 27 times the magnitude of the electric field. Or the magnitude of the electric field was equal to three times 10 to the fifth. So times three times 10 to the fifth times then cosine of the initial angle, which is 110 degrees, minus then cosine of the final angle, which is then 70 degrees. Plug in our numbers, what we find in this case then is that the change in energy, or the work, is equal to negative 3.28 times 10 to the minus 21 joules. That look like a one. Twenty one. There we go. <clears throat> so this is the work which is being done by the electric field. Everyone's okay. So that's it for this chapter. We're done. Okay. So everyone's okay? Zoom in. All right. So the last thing we have are two group assignments. Life will be great. So we got about a little more than 15 minutes. So let's kind of talk about them. I'll split you off and have you kind of start with them and then kind of go from there. Uh, this is the first one. First one's pretty simple. So what this says is we have two charges. We have Q1, uh, which is 25 centimeters along the Y axis, which has a charge of 10 to the minus six coulombs because it's a microcoulomb. Uh, and then we have charge Q2, which is 45 centimeters along the X axis, which has a charge of 13 microcoulombs. So these are both positive charges. So the first thing it wants you to do is draw the electric field in the entire space. So basically try to figure out, okay, what does the electric field look like? So this is what we did yesterday. So again, draw lines radiating positively away from each one of these two. Since the electric field lines can't cross each other, these guys are going to diverge away from each other. Okay, so it's kind of sketch what that electric field looks like. The second part then wants to say, okay, so what is, so calculate the electric field, both magnitude and direction at the origin. So if I'm sitting here at the origin, what does the electric field look like at the origin? So I know this is a positive charge, which means the electric field has to point radially away. So here, electric field one is gonna point downward in this direction. This is also a positive charge, so has to point radially away. So electric field two is gonna point off to the left. So the total electric field then is gonna point something down in this direction. So it's gonna point somewhere in the third quadrant here. Okay. So that's gonna be the electric field. So in this case, you wanna calculate just the magnitude and direction of that. <clears throat> and then part C then says, okay, so now let's take a third charge Q3 and drop it at the origin, and then what's the force on that particle? Okay. <clears throat> so this goes with what we did today. So now that we know the electric field at the origin, we can now calculate the force by simply taking this charge and multiplying by the electric field. Okay. But since this is a negative charge, what that means is if the electric field points down in this direction, the force then has to be in the opposite direction, which means it's gonna be somewhere up here. Okay. So it's gonna be along the first quadrant instead of the third quadrant. Because that negative, remember, rotates by 180 degrees. Everyone's okay? So that's the first one. The second one is then this one. So this says that suppose uh, electrons enter a uniform electric field midway between two plates at an angle of theta zero, C below, okay? 
So here the two plates are separated by one centimeter and there's an electric field which points upward, which has magnitude of 3.8 times 10 to the third newtons per coulomb. And what you find is that the path is completely symmetric and we know it has to be true because it's just parabolic motion, right? So it comes in at an angle of theta zero and it's gonna leave at an angle of theta zero. And what it wants to know then is what? So it's gonna come up and it's just gonna skim the top plates, which means the total y direction it's gonna move is then a half a centimeter. And from here, what we wanna do is determine what is the angle at which it comes in and leaves at, which turns out to be 18 degrees. It's okay? Now, the length of the plates is also relevant information, and that is six centimeters. So they're separated by one centimeter, and they are six centimeters in length, okay? Now, this one, there are two ways to do this. You can do the same way that we did in class, which is solve for the y and the x directions. Use the time. So here, you know the total height it goes in the y direction is a half a centimeter, where it has to momentarily stop. You can use that to get the time, and then, <clears throat> use the x direction as well, using the fact that the initial velocity doesn't change in the x direction, and it goes to the total six centimeters. Use those two things together to find the angle, or you can use what's known as the range equation. So if any of your instructors told you about the range equation, you can use that. Typically, we don't tell you about the range equation, but some of us do, so it just depends on who you had. Uh, pretty sure Dr. Merlot doesn't tell you about the range equation. Um, Katie, you said you had Mr. Pollock before, right? Um, I did have Professor Pollock, and he only mentioned it to tell us not to use it. <laughs> good, very good for him, that's right. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so it's up to you. You can look it up in this case. Uh, it is actually relevant in this case. Um, so the range equation, if you haven't heard of it before, uh, which again, you shouldn't use it if you don't know how to use it, uh, is it's, if something starts and finishes on its own horizontal line, it is only relevant in that case. So here, it's starting and finishing on the same horizontal line, so we can use the range equation in this case. But again, if you know about the range equation, go ahead and use it. If not, just do it the way we did those other two problems and, and life will be great. Okay, so good. So, I said, so first one's a little bit easier. So that's mostly just drawing the electric field, calculating the electric field, and then calculating the force from that electric field. And then again, the second one is yeah, a little more involved, but still not too bad, okay? So good. Uh, so you got about 10 minutes. Uh, so I'll let you guys go ahead and start kind of talking about those at least. And then that'll be the left of today. So tomorrow we'll start chapter 17. So chapter 17 is we're gonna start talking about those potentials that we did in lab. So we'll learn more about those. And then we'll talk a little bit about uh, capacitors as well. Okay. So let me get your breakout rooms started here. Uh, where's the breakout rooms? Why don't I see breakout rooms? Where'd you go? Oh, breakout rooms. There we go. Uh, how many people we got? Not many. Okay. So I guess we're going to do two breakout rooms. <laughs> That's good.
Jesus. All right, how are we doing, some of our ladies? I'm just taking down the given information still. Gotcha. Sound good. <laughs> And then I'm wanting to, oh, where's my calculator? Uh-oh, <laughs> I have to go grab my calculator. Electric paper. <laughs> Hello, ladies. Hi, we're confused already with the electric field lines. Okay. It's both positive and they're both about the same whatever charge. And then, so I like just, have that so far. Good. So keep extending that. So good. So keep going with that idea. So basically, you're right. So we'll start off by let me share my screen. You're right. So I'm gonna have the one guy here, the other guy here, and you're right. So this one's gonna point radially away like this. Thank you, Drew. This one's also gonna point radially away, just like this. Good, so now if I extend this to the center, what has to be true is these guys have to basically diverge away from each other. So it's gonna end up doing something like this. Oh, okay, so just extending it out, okay. Yeah, so you're just extending it out and using the fact they can't cross each other, so. Yeah, so it should look something like that. <clears throat> Ugh. All right, that's messy. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't have to be beautiful. It's okay. <laughs> Great. And I keep forgetting to show you guys the simulator, but no, that's fine. We'll we'll figure it out one of these days. Okay. So good. So that's that's just part A. So that's all I want you to do. At the origin. That's right. So is this one Q one or Q two? The one in the Y direction. That's Q one. Uh, one. Okay, and then Q2. So good, so again, what we know is, again, based off these lines, this one is, what, positive. So we know at the origin, this has to point down in this direction, right? So this is gonna be E1. Mm -hmm. And then Q2 is pointing also radial away, so this is going to be then E2, right? Okay? Which means that the total field is gonna point something like this, right? This is gonna be E at the origin. On that point P. P. Point P. Okay. And so we just vector some of them. That's right. Well, but each one points 90 degrees relative to the other one. Right? Okay. So basically, all that means then is what? If you're looking for the X component of the total field, well, the X component of the total field is just E2. Mm -hmm. The Y component of the total field is just E1. So you know that EPX is then just equal to E2, and then EPY is just equal to E1. So that means the magnitude of the total field at P is then just gonna be the square root of what? E2 squared plus E1 squared, so that's it. And then the angle is just gonna be the inverse tangent of the Y portion, which is E1 divided by the X portion, which is E2. AP equals that. Okay. Okay. Huh? So not too bad. Nice and easy. Okay. So then we could just we just plug that so that we're asked for the force. That's right. So, so now we know plug in force. E P or the force equals Q E. That's it. That's right. So once you know what E is, the magnitude, then you know the force is then just gonna be, in this case, what Q3, the magnitude of Q3 times E P. And then the angle, since this is a negative charge, the angle is gonna be this plus 180 degrees. So the angle of the force is then just gonna be the angle electric field plus 180 degrees. And you're, sorry, where'd you get 180 degrees? Oh, because again, since the electric field is down in this direction, but since it's a negative charge, then you know the force has to be in this direction. Oh, okay. 
Okay. So either add 180 or subtract 180. If you add 180, then it will bring you to you know, over 360 degrees, but that's the same thing as you know, subtracting 360. So it's probably easier in this case to subtract 180 degrees, so bring it back to the first quadrant, but, but yeah. That makes sense. So this is theta E, and then this is theta F. OK. Because these are 180 degrees away from each other. Mm -hmm. OK. Oh, wait. When we initially did the E, the electric field lines yep. in the magnitude calculation, is that just, why am I blank, blanking on how to get that number? Is it just the charge times, or I'm sorry. Is oh, it just no, for this one, you're using the electric field of a point charge. So this is gonna be K times oh, Q over okay. R squared. Okay. Yeah. So each one of those E's are just gonna be this guy. Because those are just point charges. All right. So let me go check on the other group here. And uh, otherwise, I'll, I'll see you in the lab in a little while. All right. All right. Okay. All right. How are we doing, ladies? Um, I, I'm on, I think we're all on part B, where we're okay. calculating the magnitude and direction at the origin. Yes. I'm doing the magnitude right now. Okay. We've gotten far enough to break it into its components. Good. So what's the component in the x direction? Um, I said the energy at the origin, the energy field at the origin is equal to uh, the energy field of the x electric component. Electric field, not electric energy field, but that's fine. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the electric field there we go. Uh, x component of q1 minus the x component of q2 and then right. similar for y okay but if you look as at... far as i had gotten because i found out that we weren't given the angles and i was like oh i know i have to go back and figure those well again so let's good let's let's go back and think about that a little bit so let me share my screen real quick so if you think about it Right, so is there any contribution to the electric field from, say, the top charge at the origin in the x direction? Right, so basically what I mean by that is, so let's, let's redraw. So if here is charge Q1, and then here's charge Q2, so the origin is the halfway point, so that's gonna be about here. So because Q1 is a positive charge, what that means is it has to point radially away along the line connecting it. So that means that here, electric field one is only pointing straight down. And since Q2 is only along the X direction, we know it has to point oh, radially away. So that means electric field two only points in the X direction. I gotcha, okay. So oh, good. So what that means is E2 is simply EX and EY is simply E1. Mm -hmm. So the electric fields from each one only point in one direction at that point. Mm -hmm. So that's the total electric field. So now it becomes a little more complicated, but the total electric field now points somewhere in this direction. So, so this means that the magnitude of EP is then simply equal to the square root of the X component squared, but the X component is just E2, plus then the Y component squared, but the Y component is just E1. Good. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. And then the angle theta E is then gonna be the inverse tangent of the Y component. But again, the Y component is E1 divided by the X component, which is E2. So the only thing we need to do now is calculate E, but E is a point charge. So it's gonna be K times Q over R squared. 
I'm still thinking in terms of vectors, I think, and that's what I haven't quite gotten to the point that it's like 360 degrees around Q1 in the radial direction, 360 okay. degrees around Q2. That's right. Anyway, I'm still thinking in terms of vectors and then just adding vectors together. Right. I suspect yeah. that if I started to do the math that way, it would I either cancel out or it would be impossible. Like I would get something that's impossible. But probably, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then you'd find out you're like, oh, I've done something wrong. We need to go back to the beginning. Exactly. So yes, it is 360 degrees all the way around. But again, what we care about is only the portion which is along the line connecting to two points. Right. So even though yes, this point is radially in all directions, and that was the part you know, the point of drawing the configuration uh, initially. Mm -hmm. But yeah, what we care about is only what's happening at that point of interest. So here, since it's along the line, we don't have to point right out of the way, so it's only at a point in this direction. So once we have these, now it's just vector addition, which is what you want to do. So it's not mm -hmm. quite as complicated. <laughs> so there's that one extra level of, you know, having to kind of think about this, so. And this will become more fun when we do magnetic fields because magnetic fields actually move in circles. So they don't move in straight lines anymore. Oh so now at this point, instead of it being in a straight line, it's actually gonna be tangential to that line. So it's gonna be in a circle, so. <clears throat> but we'll get there, not to scare you quite yet. So it'll be fun. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Good, and then part C is now just gonna be, well, we know the force is just the charge times the electric field. <laughs> That's right, so we know F is then just, in this case, Q3 times the electric field. Now, since Q3 is negative, what that means then is the force is gonna be rotated by 180 degrees. So this will be the direction of the force. Mm -hmm. So that means the angle of the force, so this is the angle of the electric field. So the angle of the force is not gonna be this much, so that's gonna be equal to the angle of the electric field minus 180 degrees. All right. All right. So good. So other than that, um, I think we're out of time. So I'll see you in lab in about 10 minutes. Okay. All right. Stop right. here. Stop. 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 Oh. <laughs>